is Juan. I'm from Pacific Northwestern National Lab, and uh, I would like to first uh, thank you for Professor Zabars for the kind invitation, and also uh, Professor Guo Lin for the um, introduction. So today I want to share with you some of my recent work about data-driven modelings of multi-scale system beyond the equilibrium. So the work I'm going to present today is a joint work with pro, uh, Professor Xiantao Li from Penn State and uh, Dr. Lei Wu from Princeton, and also my colleague uh, from PNL. And this work I'm going to present is under the support of DOE from, uh, from the National Lab. Um, as we know, the theme uh, of this workshop will be focused on the predict modeling of a complex system. However, I would like to start with a very simple system first. So that is the one-dimensional harmonic chain. Everyone like, like it, OK? So this is a very simple system. All the blue particles are connected by some harmonic potentials. So they're going to vibrate over this one, uh, x direction, OK? So this is a very, very simple system. And also we have very simple equation of motion. Everyone can solve it, OK? No problem. OK, now let's take a look at the other one. So in the second videos, we have the exactly same system, except that on these systems, we define some green particles. And these green particles represent nothing but the center of mass of four blue particles. All right? So it's the same system, but we just define some extra variables. So now my question is, OK, so what is the equation of motion for these green particles? Any ideas? For example, Think about it. If for the first one, this is a pure elastic system, OK? But what about the green particle? Is it still pure elastic, something like this, or not? All right, OK. Uh, the answer actually is no. For the green particles, the equation of motion becomes more complex. We have some extra terms here, something like this. And for those of you who are familiar with solid mechanics, this is essentially a viscous term, OK? So which means that, OK, for the f same physical system, if we try to construct the equation of motion on the different scales, the, the equation of motion could be different, OK? So this simple system just tells us that if we want to really accurately construct uh, the um, equation of motion for multi-scale or complex system, we need some mathematical rigorous way to do it. OK, and uh, I would like to thank you for the first speakers who has already introduced this one possible way. That is the moritz wanzig projection that has been proposed by some two theoretical physicists in the last two, uh, centuries. And uh, later on, Professor Alexander Chore from UC Berkeley reintroduced uh, the framework into the computation math community. So the basic idea is like this. Suppose uh, let's, we consider a dynamic system. So we have a high dimensional vector x, OK? However, we are mainly interested on some specific direction, that is A. Okay? So then we'll make a projection from X to this direction A, which gives us the vector Y. So the equation of motion for Y actually can be rigorously constructed by these formulations, which, gives, which is given by this formulation. So we can see that actually we have three terms here. So the first term uh, represents the uh, mean field approximation. But besides that, we have two additional terms, which is the memory term and the fluctuation term. And it, intuitively, you can think about these two terms appears because of the interaction between the vector y and the vector z. And another simple way to understand it is to think about some uh, very toy example. This is a two-dimensional OD system, okay, x1 and x2. Okay, that's the x here. But now, suppose we're only interested in one component, that's x1. What we can do? Let's take an integration of x2, okay, the second equation, and plug it into the first one, and which gives us something like this. Now we can see this is very similar to the to this Morris one zig projection. We have the first term, that's the mean uh, force field. And besides that, we'll have the memory term and the fluctuations. Okay, that's very simple. So now if we turn back to the system we've seen in the previous slides, you can see, so if we want to make a projection, that's the blue particles, uh, to the green particles, now we have two, three terms. The first term is the elastic systems, but uh, is like elastic terms. But besides that, we have two additional terms. That is the viscous term, which is a, essentially a memory term, and the random force terms. Well, of course, 
Although this uh, formulation give us the exact uh, the dynamic evolution of y, as, introduced, as also mentioned by the previous speakers, numerically, it is not easy to construct such projections. So essentially, how to construct this mean force terms and the memory term, that is actually a non-trivial question. Uh, so in practice, the, the computational models we've seen a lot of uh, in the textbook, a lot of uh, canonical dynamic process, actually we take some further approximation based on these formulations. So for example, if you consider some very simple diffusion process, one perspective is that, okay, we're going to keep the, all the details of the system. Okay? We're going to track all the position of the particles in this confined geometry. So we call it full dynamics. But on the other hand, we can also construct some reduced models. So we're going to generate some mesh. And then we're going to define some physical variable. We call it a density on each of the grid point. And then we turn into the Fourier modes, which give us a CK. Now, we're going to take some further assumptions, which assume that we're only interested in the low wave number, that is K approach zero. And then we also employ the linear response theory to further approximate the memory term. And by doing all this, essentially we have something like this. And for those of you who are familiar with statistic physics, this is nothing but the uh, integration of the velocity correlation function, which is essentially the diffusion coefficient, right? And then if we turn back into the spatial and temporal domain, it gives us basically the heat equation. And that is the PDE we've seen in the textbook, which we use it to describe something like the diffusion process, right? But, but now we can see that in reality, if we consider some micro, uh, sorry, uh, complex systems, well, this assumption, let's say the linear response theory and the wave number approach zero, this, all this kind of assumption doesn't hold, then these canonical equations may not be, cannot be directly applied to the complex systems. So in order to do, to do this, we have to uh, how we develop some method to parameterize these non-local uh, models. And in particular, if we are mainly interested in something like the Hamiltonian system, usually we can, then we can further uh, approximate the morris pro, uh formalism into something like the, the called unparameterized generalized, generalized non-dual equation. So essentially, this reduced component has two parts, which, uh, which is the Q and the P. So Q usually refers to the position of the reduced model, and the P refers to the momentums. And for the dynamics of the system, we have uh, three components. Which the, uh, the first one is the free energy, and the second one is the memory, and the third one is the random force. And the random force term is related to the memory term through this fluctuation dissipation theorem. And regarding the dynamic uh, system, Usually, we have two scenarios. The first scenario is that within a very long time, the, si the system will make, uh, make some uh, fluctuation or wander around some matter state state. So I defi defined it as the quasi equilibrium properties. So for these scenarios, so basically, the mathematical challenge is that how do you quantify the uncertainties within this high dimensional random space? And then for sometimes, we also would like to get the explicit multi dimensional density estimations. And is, um, that's so, and also, this is a very challenging topic in both statistics, with this, that's called a multi-dimensional density estimation, but also in some other fields, something like the computational chemistry and the computational uh, ca physics, that's essentially the free energy calculation. So a lot of researchers, including myself, have, have put a lot of thought on these directions, but today, I would like to focus on the second one, which is the non-equilibrium dynam dynamics, which means that the, syst the system may make some abrupt transitions from one state to the other. And for these situations, we not only need the free energy term, but also the memory term. Why? We can take a very, uh, another simple example. So for suppose, okay, you're hiking your mountains. Okay, this is the mountain. And now, right now, you have a 2D contour map with you. So now the question is that, suppose you want to take a hiking from one camping site to the other camping site. Now the question is that, can we use this 2D contour map to tell you what is the optimized path for you to take a hiking to from uh, site A to site B. Can you use this map to do it or not? The answer again is no, because this 2D contour map is basically, basically just tell us, uh, uh, basically essentially some uh, mean field approximation of these mountains. 
So you don't know the exact local roughness of the mountain. So that's why you cannot really determine what is the optimized path from site A to site B. And that's essentially the non-local energy dissipation process we're trying to recover. Okay, so now this is the problem set up. Now so, so we have a generalized long run equations. Suppose we already know the free energy. So the task is construct this non-local memory term. Well, as uh, mentioned from the, also the first speakers, this is also very, this is essentially a very difficult problem. Uh, the major challenge is that it's very difficult to construct the uh, orthogonal dynamics, okay? And also, directly solving this integral, integral equation is numerically unstable. So here, we have some um, I uh, incomplete review of relative approach on these directions. So in order to construct uh, this, um, the generalized long run equations, well, the easiest way is, of course, to make the Markovian approximation. So this elegant idea is actually dates back to the last century by Einstein, which basically they construct, propose something like the Brownian motion, which assumed that the memory curve decays so fast that we can approximate it as a delta functions. And uh, following that, um, people from chemistry developed something like uh, the reaction rate theories from the Kramer theory. And uh, also, there's a lot of uh, computational models has been developed based on these assumptions, uh, which applies to the mesoscale hydrodynamic simulations. Okay? And the second uh, approach is related to the direct evaluation of the memory kernels. That is the, something like the short memory approximation from Alexander Chorin, and also the evaluation of, uh, of the orthogonal dynamics, or directly solving the integral equations. And the third approach is mainly uh, fields uh, in the topic of this workshop, that is the data-driven approach. So the basic idea is that we're going to assume some answers of the of these cross grained models, and then we're going to use some training set to learn the mapping from the fine uh, from the full dynamics to the cross grained dynamics, or on the both way. That's the fr that's the talk from the first presentations. Okay, and the method I'm going to present today also fall in these categories. But before that, I want to briefly review a previous approach we have developed with my collaborators. So the, I, the basic idea of our previous work is that, OK, we're going to transfer the generalized long run equations into the equation of a correlation matrix. So we're going to multiply the initial velocities and the take an ensemble average, which give us some integration equation like, uh, like this. So G and the H are the correlation matrix, which are related to the memory kernel theta. That is something we're trying to recover. And next, we're going to approximate the equations in the Laplace space and going to construct uh, the memory kernel theta in this Laplace space. In the particular, we're going to construct these memory kernels using the rational function approximation by this specific answers. And the advantage, main advantage is that by doing this, we can cast the generalized long run equation, which is driven by a color noise, into some extended dynamics into, um, driven by the white noise. And by doing this, we can naturally impose the fluctuation dissipation theorem, which is very difficult to impose in general as from the first speakers. So, and also, this approach can retain the invariant measure of the original system. So that is the main advantage of doing this. Well, there's some disadvantage of this method is that we have to evaluate the high order moment of the correlation functions. And also, well, it is non-trivial to construct high order approximation related to some numerical linear algebra issues. So, in the following, I'm going to introduce a new approach where, where we're going to construct uh, stochastic reduced models based on Galakian projections so that we, are not, we don't need to evaluate the high order moment and also we we'll have better numerical robustness. Okay, so here's the basic ideas. Suppose now, we have, in general, we we'll have a reduced, uh, we'll have a reduced uh, variable A, okay, that which is as a function of the x, x is the full uh, variables. Now, we're going to project a dynamic evolution A, which is the reduced uh, variables, onto a set of projecting bases called the Psi. And uh, we're going to approximate this as a linear combination of the, this Psi, but C is the coefficient matrix. And how to determine C? We're going to apply by a set of test bases, we we'll call it Psi, and this inner product is defined with respect to the equilibrium density distribution of the full system. And by doing this, we can see that we can determine this uh, coefficient uh, matrix C 
by this linear uh, algebras, okay? We can do that, and we can see that the matrix M and the matrix K can be obtained through the inner product of, the, of this uh, projection basis and test basis. It's no problem. Okay, this could be a little abstract. Let me take an example. So, specifically, if we choose the projection basis as A and LA, and the test basis as A and L inverse A, and here I just want to uh, explain that the L inverse A is defined by this formulation, which is a little bit sloppy in this um, mathematically. But I'm going to clarify this definition in a few slides. But okay, so if we basically take this, uh, the, take the formulation of this projection basis test basis, then it is possible to construct a stochastic models following this formulation, such that the correlation may, uh, function of the reduced model, which is this one, will uh, match with the correlation function of the full system on these four quantities. Okay, so that's the something I claim. To prove it, the key idea is that we're going to choose the uh, the covariance matrix of sigma, that is the white noise of the of the reduced models, such that the reduced variable tilde a and the, this extended variable d will satisfy the following two conditions. And the, suppose we can choose sigma such that a tilde and a d satisfy these two conditions, then we can show that the correlation matrix of the reduced models will match with the realistic, um, so, oh, so, sorry, the full system on these boundary derivatives. And also, we can show that the time integration of the g tilde and the g tilde prime also match with the full systems. Okay, so that's the basic ideas. All right. So, so far so good. So, so far we have a full system. We have some resolved variable A, and then we're gonna project it into some linear systems. That's A tilde, such that we have some the correlation matrix match with the original ones on certain quantities. That's fine. But however, we can see there's a disadvantage by this construction. Is that basically no matter what is the original system, we map it into a linearized system, which means that the free energy of the reduced model becomes quadratic, and which means that the equilibrium density of the reduced model becomes Gaussian. But we know that in realities, if we consider some reduced um, system variables, for example, these biomolecules, in this conformation space, we know that this distribution could be non-Gaussian in general. So if we make the, uh, if we make this map linearize the mappings, and then we end up with something that gives us some Gaussian distribution, so we lose some modeling. Um, we have some modeling bio style. So to remedy this, I'm going to introduce a, another construction of the non-linear projection. So the basic idea is that okay, we're going to split the dynamic evolution into two parts. Well, L1B refers to the nonlinear part, that is essentially refers to the free energy of the system. And then we're going to construct the linear mapping with only res with res respect to LA minus L1B. Okay, that is the part we're going to construct the projections. And then by choosing the proper set of test bases, we're able to transfer the original system into something like this, this uh, the following stochastic reduced uh, models. And, uh, oh. and we can see that this uh, matrix J hat can be also obtained by this linear system, while the matrix M hat and the K hat can be also obtained directly. Okay, so another simple example. So in particular, if we choose the projection basis specifically by these two, and the test basis by this A and the L, uh, L inverse A, then I claim that it is possible to construct a stochastic model following this, uh, uh, following these formulations, and also the correlation function of the resolved variables of the reduced models will match with the original ones on these four quantities. And the proof is also quite straightforward. So the key idea is also we choose the matrix sigma, which is de determine the covariance matrix of this white noise. We choose sigma into with certain uh, formulations, which I'm going to sc um, specify later, such that the quantity A tilde and the D satisfies this relationship. 
And after that, after some, some mathematical derivation, we can show that these four quantities will match with the original ones. Okay? All right, so far, I'm in, I have introduced two projections, which is a linear projection and nonlinear projections. And we can show that by properly choosing the projection basis and the test basis, we can match a certain quantity of the correlation matrix, which is good. However, the next question I'm considering is that, what about if, if we want to match more quantities? Not only the four, we want more, more accurate constructions. How can we do that? Then intuitively, is that, okay, maybe we can choose more projection basis and a more test basis, something like that. Okay. Yeah, okay. Okay, so, okay, so how to choose the projection basis? Well, we have seen the two, these two, right? A and the L, A minus L1B. What other can we choose? Intuitively, maybe we can choose something like this. A, L, A, the first two, and then we have something like a further derivatives and, and high order derivatives, something like that. Is that good? Theoretically, that's good, but in practice, this we have some disadvantage because we have this involves the evaluation of a high order derivatives, and in practice, this may introduce a lot of numerical errors. So that's something we want to avoid. How do you do that? Okay. So here we propose something new, that we introduce something. Okay, the first two is the same, but then we have we have some other basis with respect to some derivative uh, due to d, and what is d? This is essentially some fractional derivatives. And here, we choose the standard riemann uh fractional derivative. And in practice, we're going to choose the alpha between minus 1 to 1 for the different bases. So the major uh, reason to do that is that, OK, we choose the uh, different uh, alpha, so we have different bases. But on the other hand, we avoid evaluating the high, or high order of derivatives. And also, as we know, the fractional derivative is a non-local operator. So implicitly, we impose the non-local information into our models, okay? And what about the test base? Oh, I've seen these two, okay, A and the L inverse A. What else can we choose? So here, I propose to choose something like this, okay, which is defined like, like this. And we can see that by choosing different lambda, we have different bases. And also, if we take, in particular, if we choose lambda go to infinity, this recovers the, uh, the L inverse uh, we've seen earlier. And in particular, in practice, we can choose the number of test bases larger than the number of projection bases, which gave us basically the least square of fittings. Okay, to wrap up the method, as I promised, we, we have to construct the re reduced models which satisfy the fluctuation dissipation theorem. And uh, how can, do, can we do that? I'm going to show you. So the first, is that I'm going to claim that it is possible to construct these stochastic models by choosing the projection and the test basis such that the effective um, kernel of these uh, systems will match with the original system on the following quantities. As we can see that with the effective kernel match uh, the boundary and the boundary derivatives. And besides that, it has an interpol automatic interpolation at the different uh, values in the Laplace space, which is which is better than only evaluated the boundaries. And also, we can choose the sigmas, which is such that a tilde and a d will satisfy the prescribed quantities. And how to do that? So, so here we'll give the conclusions. So basically, the, the system will satisfy the fluctuation dissipation theorems with the desired covariance matrix, as long as uh, we choose this uh, matrix sigma satisfy these formulations, okay? And uh, since j hat and q hat is already known, we can, do, we can always define this as sigma. And also, these reduced stochastic models have some invariant distribution like this. And we can see that we have some nonlinear, non-Gaussian distribution automatically introduced in these formulations. Okay, just a few examples. So the first example is the diffusion process that Einstein has considered last centuries. But we know that in realities, we have the memory kernel has non-local structures which is deviated from the brown emotions. Okay, so that's the realistic system and the blue one is the Einstein's theory. So we're trying to recover this. So here's some result. We can see that the scale color is the, uh, is the present method which match with the realistic MD simulation 
much better than the previous method, which is based on the rational function approximation. And also, the, on the right-hand side, shows the numerical errors of these memory kernels, which is uh, defined between lambda, between 0 and 10. And we can see the present method, which is the blue line, is, shows more accurate result than the previous approach. And these two dashed lines refer to the, the velocity correlation function in the Laplace space. And in time domain, we can also show that given the same order of approximations, the present method, which is the blue ones, uh, shows more accurate result than the previous approach based on rational function approximations. And here we can see that as, we, as long as we, uh, as we gradually introduce the high order projections, the result will approach the MD simulation results. So I think I'm going to skip for this transition and go to the last slide, which where we can see the biomolecules where we have a confirmation, oops, has a confirmation fluctuations. So we're trying to construct the reduced models to characterize the transition between these two metastable state. And as we introduce the high order projections, uh, we can success, successfully predict the reaction rate between these two metastable states. Okay, so I think I'm going to stop here for the questions. Thank you. Uh -huh. Unique, right? the linearized, both the linear and non-linear, how do you choose these? The, um, I choose the, so first of all, A is the something I already choose as the reduced mode, uh, reduced value, right? A is uh, something I already prescribed, that's the reduced one. Right. And then, yeah, uh, what is the, how do you? How do you choose A as the starting Oh, how do I choose A as the starting mode? That's kind of something like a user specified. Some, yeah, that's something. For example, if, uh, uh, if we are trying to construct a, a reduced mode of uh, biomolecules, for, for example, for example, I was going to choose the, something like the dehydrogen angle, some bound angle, something like that is something user specified. So it's not unique. Um, uh, that's not unique. How, what, what is the best one? Well, that's something, I think that's an open question. How do you, so I think the, my starting point for this work is that we ha already have a kind of user specified reduced um, reduced the variable A, which is a function of the X, which is the full system. And then we're going to, starting from this, say how to construct an um, accurate model, characterize the dynamic evolution of this A, where match, which match with the uh, dynamic evolution in the original system. That's the, our starting point. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and one more quick thing. Sure. So the, the stage that you do high order stage it looks like a kind of space to me when you have a high high order mm -hmm. for you base it looks like quite a lot of things where you have a higher higher order of L L one L square and so on and so forth. So but you said that it's not linear but it's local operator, right? These are differential operators of local thing. Then you move to the fraction of the river which is non local mm -hmm. uh, but which is much more complicated to, to compute. I'm not sure there's a reason behind it. Why why is it better than the uh, the other choice? Uh, so here is the so the major, uh, so the information we have already have in hand is the correlation function of A that is collected from the full system. That's something already know. So if we define the non-local operators, this all this information is already at, um, we already have this at hand. So it's not, that's not something extra thing we have to collect. We can directly utilize this all the time, the, um, the correlation function over this whole time domain to construct the matrix M and the matrix K, which give us the matrix J. That's already we have, so we don't take extra computation time to do that. Mm -hmm.